of the first day uh, of the conference within the exhibition liquidation. Uh, if you still haven't managed, uh, the exhibition is just around the corner uh, in the gallery space of uh, Galeria Miroslav Kraljevic, so please use the time between uh, the two sessions and break to go see uh, the exhibition um, <clears throat> that this is the part of. Um, we start the second part with the talk of uh, Neil Brenner. Neil Brenner is professor of urban theory at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he teaches classes on critical urban theory, urban political economy, and socio-spatial theory, and works closely with architects, landscape architects, planners, cartographers, to develop new approaches to understanding, representing, and influencing <coughs> urban trans contemporary urban transformations. His most recent book, Implosions Slash Explosions, is to be released in 2014, and it will build upon the work of Henri Lefebvre <laughs> to elaborate the methodological foundations for investigating 21st century forms of global urbanization. Other, his other books include New State Spaces from 2004, A Study of Urban Governance and State Spatial Restructuring in Europe, during the second half of the 20th century, and several volumes on the need for a critical approach to urban questions in the age of neoliberal capitalism, including Cities for People, Not for Profit, Critical Urban Theory, The Right to the City, which was co-edited with uh, Margit Maia and P Peter Marcuse, uh, and Spaces of Neoliberalism, co-edited together with Nick Theodor, whom we had the pleasure of uh, hearing uh, earlier this year. Also at Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design, Brenner directs the Urban Theory Lab, a research collective that uses the tools of critical urban theory, historical ge geopolitical economies, and radical cartography to decipher emergent patterns of urbanization, dispossession, and <coughs> struggle under 21st century capitalism. The lab's current work explores the urbanization of Earth's most remote places extreme territories such as the Arctic, the Amazon, the Sahara Desert, the Himalayas, and the Gobi Steppe, as well as the oceans and the atmosphere. Brenner is also currently collaborating with uh, Christian Schmidt at the ETH Zurich on uh, a book project enti entitled Planetary Urbanization. Uh, before giving word to, to uh, Neil, I would just also like to mention that there are copies there of um, freshly printed, um, well, it's a, it's a, let's call it journal, it's called Interventions, Interventie, uh, where there is a text uh, by uh, Jamie Peck, Nick Theodore, and uh, Neil Brenner, uh, The Afterlives uh, of Neoliberalism in Croatian Translation. So, Neil, thank you for coming over, yeah. and please take the word. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Tomislav, thank you for that introduction. Tomislav has invited me to Zagreb many times, and finally it worked out. So I'm really delighted, and thanks also to Sonia and others in the organization for making it possible to be here. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, as Tomislav mentioned, I work in the field of critical urban theory, and what that means for me is basically that I'm trying to understand cities, I'm trying to understand urbanization processes. And that's not a simple matter, actually. I mean, I think we know that. One reason, it's not a simple matter for a lot of reasons. One reason is that cities are changing dramatically around us. Um, economic restructuring, spatial restructuring, it's happening in different ways in different places. But another reason why it's not easy to understand is because the concepts that we use to understand cities and urbanization are fully mediated through ideology. I mean, we had a wonderful discussion this morning with Boris about some of the, the kind of ideological dynamics that inform our understanding of contemporary capitalism and I would argue that the sort of that urban ideologies are just proliferating all around us today and what I mean by that is that on the one hand cities have become like strategically important for all kinds of um, economic and political actors and for social movements but at this but and for precisely for that reason the way we interpret what cities are how they're changing who controls the city, who controls urbanization, that itself becomes the terrain of ideological contestation. So it's for that reason 
that I think urban theory, above all critical urban theory, is like more important than, than ever. It's precisely because these ideologies, these discourses, these obfuscatory, oftentimes misleading, disempowering discourses about the city and the urban are proliferating and being used and instrumentalized to justify and legitimate and naturalize all kinds of processes of urban restructuring that we need critical urban theory to help us decipher what those transformations are and to develop counter narratives, counter conceptualizations of, um, of what's actually going on in the world. So that's maybe um, just a, by way of introduction, like that's how I understand my work as a scholar, as a teacher who engages with the design disciplines. It's precisely the battle. It's not only that, but a big part of it is it's the battle over the categories and the interpretations of how we understand cities and urbanization. We have to occupy that terrain. We have to reoccupy it using more radical and progressive and empowering discourses instead of letting neoliberal discourses define the terrain. So it's not just, just to be very clear about this, the problem for me is not just that neoliberalization is transforming and enclosing urban space. That's already problematic enough. I think we all agree that's problematic. We want to fight that. It's that the, that neoliberal project, and there are many neoliberal projects, are themselves being fought out through ideology, through discourse, through interpretations of what the cities are. And that's why we need radical, critical urban theories. So that's just by way of framing what I want to do today. So I'm told I have about 45 minutes to speak. I got my stopwatch going, so don't worry. When, my, when it gets to be 45 mi minutes, I'll hopefully not crash land, but I'll gently glide this plane to the runway. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to start this thing just by laying out some, I think I've got five or six propositions about kind of how critical urban theory, obviously a broad set of theories and discourses about urbanization, how critical urban theory thinks about um, capitalism, just in general, like cities and capitalism. So that's kind of the first step. And then I'm going to outline kind of some of the, the contradictions and contestations that um, flow around cities under capitalism. So it's a pretty abstract kind of meta-theoretical beginning, but I've tried to make it very user-friendly just by dividing this thing into like a few propositions. So that's just kind of the first half of this presentation. We'll see how long that takes. And then I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about neoliberalization in relation to cities and urbanization. So concretize it a little bit. So let me also just one more disclaimer before I dive into this. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about um, specific places or even specific territories. I'm going to be at a pretty abstract level. But part of, um, it seems to me, what, what theory is, like by definition, it's an abstraction. And the challenge, and this is maybe part of what we can dialogue about, is, is to see whether some broader meta-theoretical arguments about ideology, about cities, about urbanization, about struggle, can help us understand some of the um, dynamics and struggles and power relations that were discussed this morning in relation to, um, to Eastern Europe and ex-Yugoslavia. And we can also, I think, debate quite productively about the degree to which some of these theoretical arguments might be productively applied to other contexts. So part of what I'm going to argue is that neoliberalization processes are indeed occurring all over the world. But one of the claims that I've been making for a while with Nick Theodore and Jamie Peck, whose work, or some of our articles, as Tomislav mentioned, are now translated, um, is that neoliberalization, even though it's kind of a generalized process, it's variegated. It takes locally specific forms, but, but those locally specific forms in turn hinge upon their embeddedness within a broader system of market-oriented regulatory restructuring. So that's the kind of flight plan, if I can stay with my, my flying metaphor. I'm going to try to cover, again, starting with these general arguments about sort of what does critical urban theory have to tell us about how capitalism is evolving, and then I'll shift gears in the latter part of the talk towards talking about neoliberalization. So, um, critical theory at work, I, I've got a lot about autogestion in here, which I would do even if I weren't in Zagreb. I'm really interested in self-management and autogestion, so I was very glad that that theme came up this morning. So just some foundational claims, a series of propositions. So first proposition, the urban is a key site in which the social relations and contradictions of capitalism and modern political life are fought out. So in this particular tradition, and I'll be, I'll, 
unpack this in more detail as we go. But in this particular tradition, and this is obviously a very Lefebvrean conceptualization. It's not only Lefebvre, but it was certainly a, an argument that he, he made very powerfully and I think convincingly. Um, the ermine is not just simply a, um, a territory that you can draw a, re a circle around. And then you focus on that, and then you also focus on other, other areas. The ermine is a force field of spatial transformations associated with capital accumulation, industrial, industrialization, commodification. So it's a very complex terrain of spatial transformations that takes many different morphological forms. The city is one. There are many other forms as well associated with this urbanization process. But um, part of Lefebvre's whole spatialization of Marxism was this insistence on the urban as a key site in which the broader social and economic and political dynamics of capitalism are not just articulated but fought out. So when we start to look at the urban question, what, what uh, Castell famously called la question urbaine, the urban question, we're actually in a certain way spatializing our whole understanding of the basic dynamics of capitalist industrialization, capital accumulation, capital circulation. And looking at the ways in which those processes are spatialized and also the ways in which they're contested in different ways, in different spaces and historical moments. And again, the consequence of that which I already alluded to in my opening remarks, is that if you, if you think that's a plausible argument, then we actually urgently need critical urban theories, not just a set of static propositions that defines what the city or what the urban is, but rather a set of evolving arguments about the nature of the urban and the nature of the city under different historical phases of capitalism and political struggle. So urban theory, above all critical urban theory, is an attempt precisely to clarify the nature, the changing nature of that urban force field, or maybe to put it more precisely, that force field of urbanization and the social and political struggles that are continuously churned up within that force field. So that's a strong, that's already like, I could sit down right now and like, let's discuss. That's already a strong proposition. But in a way, that's just the launching point for the tradition of radical urban theory. I mean, again, in some ways that goes back to Engels. Um, you know, it certainly is an argument that's articulated in some other traditions of Western Marxism during the 20th century, but it's really in the late 1960s and early 1970s that you see writers like Lefebvre, Castells, and of course David Harvey, and many others in the wake of those authors developing, developing this argument and really suggesting um, a kind of spatialization of capitalism with reference to the urban. So that's proposition one. Proposition two is in a certain way an attempt to further historicize and spatialize that, proposi that first proposition. So the nature of the urban changes in patterned rhythms, in patterned cycles, in relation to cycles of capital accumulation and state regulation. So for those of you who are familiar with the tradition of French and German regulation theory, um, this is a certain kind of regulationist argument. So in other words, even if we accept that the urban is a key force field within which the socio-spatial relations of capitalism are articulated and fought out, that takes different forms in different places, and it's not just random difference. There are cycles of capital accumulation, phases of capitalist development. We spoke earlier about Fordism, or Fordist Keynesianism, or we might say Fordist Keynesian developmentalism. We're speaking today about neoliberalism, which is arguably we might debate about is that a new stage or a new phase of capitalist development. There are obviously f stages of capitalist de development prior to Fordism or Fordist Keynesianism or Fordist Keynesian developmentalism as well. So cycles of capital accumulation, periods of tendential growth, followed by the articulation of certain contradictions within that accumulation regime, leading to a crisis and breakdown of the accumulation regime and associated regulatory configurations in a period of restructuring. So the argument in this tradition is that the, the evolution of world capitalism, at least since the, um, the first industrial revolution, is a series of cycles of growth and decline which are always mediated through regulatory configurations at various spatial scales. So um, I think in this group, that argument is maybe something that we would all take for granted. But in the more general field of urban studies these days, we still have to make an argument, or more and more we have to make an argument for the need for political, a kind of historical political economy. Political economy perspectives are in a certain way on the defensive and marginalized, at least within a lot of the circles that I move in, 
where for me this is just standard operating procedure like this isn't even I mean it's I mean I think again given the the nature of our discussion this morning people in this group are fully immersed in a kind of political economic perspective not that that exhausts reality but that's certainly a key dimension through which to understand some of the transformations of urban um, of urban of urban development during the current period and and in earlier historical periods so we need a kind of historical urban political economy in order to understand how urbanization processes are embedded within particular strategies for promoting capital accumulation and associated regulatory arrangements that attempt to stabilize and legitimate those um, forms of accumulation. And that leads in turn to a third proposition that's been really important for me in a lot of the work I've been doing for, God, a couple of decades now actually, but it's, um, it's a proposition that has far-reaching ramifications. And that is that the production of the urban is mediated fundamentally by historically specific forms of state power. So in regulations terms, we call them modes of regulation, but policy, planning, etc. So the consequence of this is that um, a purely economistic approach to urbanization, uh, a purely accumulation-centric approach to the city and urbanization is actually deeply one-sided because the fabric of the urban at every scale from the you know, streetscape outside our window here to the scale of the city, to the scale of the region, to the scale of the territory, all the way up to the scale of the world urban system is fully mediated by various modes of regulation, various state institutions at a whole range of spatial scales. So the, the fabric of the built environment, the fabric of the territory, the configuration of systems of logistics and circulation, uh, et cetera, all of these are mediated through state policies and state institutions at various spatial scales. Some, in some ways, so let me put it this way, there are many state policies and state institutions that are explicitly spatial. So most national states in the world have some ministry or bureau that's devoted to what the Germans call Raumordnung, what in French, I guess it's l'aménagement du territoire, so territorial management. And there are many other versions of that word, whether it's a department of urban development. But I would make the argument that many other branches and aspects of state institutions and state power, even if they're not explicitly spatial in terms of their intention, they have massive consequences for the spatial organization of urban development. So the state is fundamentally mediating urbanization processes. Urbanization processes are fundamentally mediated by the state. What that also means in terms of some of the questions that I think we want to debate about, which we've already been debating about here, is that the state is itself uh, a terrain of struggle over the form and pathway of urban development. So Poulonsas, the great uh, Greek state theorist, made that argument long ago in general terms, that the state is a social force and it is a terrain of struggle in which diverse social forces um, engage in strategies and struggles over the form of, of capitalist development. I mean, that was, that was Poulonsas' very, it's kind of a neo-Gramscian understanding of what the state is all about. And I'm kind of spatializing this a little bit via Lefebvre. So in other words, occupying and gaining control over state institutions or trying to influence state institutions can itself be, must itself be, a uh, means of trying to influence and uh, assert control over processes of urbanization. Now that obviously raises many different political and strategic questions which I think we, we need to talk about. And this in turn leads to a fourth proposition. So again, very closely connected to what I just said, which is that the urban, so it's not just that the, so the prior proposition was the state is a terrain of struggle over the urban, but now I'm pushing this notion of the terrain of struggle a step further. The urban itself is a terrain of struggle um, forms of cityness, city development, urbanization are not simply imposed from above by capital or by state institutions. Um, the urban, the city, urbanization processes are produced and mediated through social movements. In other words, movements that are not themselves embedded within the state and may not even be oriented directly towards the state. They too produce the urban. So for me, this is a very important and powerful proposition that emerges from the last really four decades of radical urban theory. In some ways, Manuel Castells is the re real pioneer 
of that emphasis on urban social movements as uh, a kind of force that produces and transforms um, uh, the city and the urban. We should let our friend in. Come on in, don't worry. <laughs> um, so in other words, when Castells was writing, um, if you want to just, if some of the people over here want to just, if you guys are comfortable, then stay where you are, but I'm not offended if people want to. Okay, good. So the point is that, um, is that the urban that we see around us, I mean, it's actually a, a really quite far-reaching proposition, both politically and epistemologically. You walk down a street, any city in the world, and you think, if you don't know the history of the place, you think, well, there's a building, or there's a street, or there's an infrastructure, and it's just everyday life. You take it for granted. So like, I was, when I got here last night, I was walking down the street with Tomislav, and for me, you know, I, I've never been to Zagreb before. It's a new space, so I'm just trying to absorb. But Tomislav, like many others, I think in this room, has a history of struggle over the fabric of the built environment, over the occupation of the built environment. So he's pointing out different, uh, different spaces from a bookstore to, you know, other uh, buildings around here that, that people, are, I think, in this group have struggled over. And, and so in your experience and in your way of seeing the city, it's a battleground. It's not just taken for granted. And that, I obviously fully embrace that way of seeing. Instead of taking for granted the most trivial or the most non-trivial aspect of the built environment, you, you view everything as the product of decisions, strategies, and indeed struggles. And that's an argument that, at least in the scholarly literature, definitely goes back to Castells when he wrote The City and the Grassroots, and certainly has continued in the literature on urban social movements um, up to this day, that, the, that urban movements are central agents of urbanization processes, both historically they have been, and that's in a way also an imperative for our current moment all over the world in cities and territories, that urban movements continue to have a key role to play in shaping and reshaping, appropriating and reappropriating the built environment from other forces that are trying to impose their own visions um, upon uh, uh, their own visions um, about the future of the city. Fifth proposition, and this is still on the theme of urban social movements. So urban social movements, when we speak of these urban social movements in relation to any particular place, it's not, the, the, the point about them is not just that they're located within the city and we say, ah, they're urban social movements, and then they're rural social movements, and they're suburban social movements, and you can just <coughs> replicate the word that goes before the social movement just to describe its location. That's not the sense in which the notion of an urban social movement is meant in this literature by Castells, by Margaret Meyer, by others who, who work in this literature. They are qualitatively connected to the changing form of urban development. So when we call them urban, it's not just saying, oh, they're located in the city and they're trying to occupy this space or change the direction of this subway line, so therefore they're urban. The claim in this literature is that they're, they're qualitatively connected to a particular urbanization project which either they, they might support it, they might oppose it. So the nature, again, I've already suggested, I've already tried to suggest that the, the urban in this tradition, it's thoroughly historical. So the way the United Nations or other organizations, they say, here's what the urban is, and they have a you know, population threshold or a population density threshold or a male non-agricultural employment threshold. There are all kinds of different definitions. This tradition says, actually, no. That, that's not the way to understand the phenomenon. The phenomenon itself is produced through social relations and transformed through social relations. So any attempt to demarcate it, it just gets, to, you know, you can use that demarcation. There are, you know, hundreds of definitions out there. I collect those definitions to try to see how they're used by the UN and by other organizations. But the social relations themselves just explode and transform those particular definitions. So that's relevant to this proposition here too because the nature of an urban social movement, let's say under Fordism or under state socialism, changes with the crisis of those particular formations. Um, and obviously, we're seeing a proliferation of all kinds of urban social movements under conditions of neoliberalization. That's something that I think everyone in this room cares about. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So the question is, how are they articulated to emergent forms of accumulation, emergent profit-making strategies, and emergent modes of state regulation? So that's a conversation that, in a way, we already began, I think, quite um, in a quite an interesting way this morning, and I'm just pres I'm just sort of turning that here into a broader theoretical proposition. 
Okay, final proposition. Um, and this is really the heart of the thing in some ways. This is the politics. There are many different political positions in this literature that I'm describing here on radical or critical urban theory, but for me, this is really the fundamental political orientation of the whole literature. This is really its, its horizon. So the urban is the site and the stake of struggles over the future of capitalism and maybe the future of the world, since the whole world is at this point pretty much capitalist. And the claim of this literature is that social forces can and must reappropriate the urban commons and counteract the rule of capital. So I'll just say it, y'all. It's an anti-capitalist, uh, uh, you know, theory. It's trying to understand capitalism. And if we don't understand capitalism, we can't even begin to think about what a post-capitalist social formation would look like. But the claim is that the rule of capital is highly destructive of the shared social and ecological conditions that we all produce and depend upon for our common life. And the claim is that we need something else. So we might not know the, have the, we might not have the answer to what that something else is, but <clears throat> excuse me, but the kind of oppositional, highly critical orientation towards the rule of capital and the search for a, um, a means to collectively control the social and spatial commons, not just of the city, but of the world, is part of what this project is. And so the, the challenge and the task... Second. Can everybody yeah, just move, yeah, move here closer so in. there is room for people coming in? Exactly. We're, it, it probably would be good, if people are not too shy about it, of relocating to that side, because that way as more people come in, we have... Um, we, I'm going to stop my stopwatch. I get a little time out. This doesn't count against me. Have a sip of water. <laughs> yeah, but if some people would move, that way if a few other people come in, then we're, um, I'll even carry the chair this way. Thank you, Parker. Okay, great. Thanks, y'all. Okay, cool. So, um, so, <laughs> so, um, so the consequence of that proposition, again, it's not like we know what the strategy should be. It's a dialectical approach. It's a critical dialectical approach to forms of dispossession and inequality and social and ecological destruction that are induced through the system. And the, the point here is that part of what the remit, the task of critical urban theory is is precisely to clarify the changing terrain uh, and the strategic possibilities and constraints and the stakes of these urban struggles. So again, it's always, this is a fundamental point. I keep reiterating it, but I, I think it's really methodologically and politically important. This whole theoretical approach is fundamentally historical. It is fundamentally historical. And what I mean by that is that it's a methodological orientation through which to interpret a world that's changing in ways that we don't know how it's going to change. So it's not a theory of the historical trajectory of with, it's not teleological in that sense. There are processes that are going on which are politically mediated. People are constantly making decisions, engaging in strategic uh, actions that are shaping and reshaping that terrain, which in turn forms the terrain on which new movements and struggles emerge. So it's very open-ended in that sense. It's a very open-ended form of, it's a dialectical kind of critical Marxian theory, but but we do not know, you know, there's no law going on here that's defining the pathway. The pathway is defined through political and social struggle, period. Like, so that, that's why I keep saying that this point about it's historically specific. So the theory provides an orientation, it provides tools, and then through the collective dialogue that we engage in, one tries to use these theoretical orientations to clarify the changing terrain, the strategic possibilities and constraints, and the possibilities, the possible openings on the horizon. That's how I understand, basically, these six propositions, in a way, that's, that's like what I'm trying to do in my work. That's part of what I think a lot of other critical urban theorists are trying to do. So, so hopefully it has some relevance, not just for scholarly research, which I think it does, and obviously is ge that, this tradition has generated you know, huge amounts of scholarly research and continues to inspire generations of um, young and critical and radical urbanists, but I think it also has relevance for... Um, conversations about about social movement strategy and political strategy more generally. Okay, so you know, 
I was very glad that um, the discussion around autogestion, self-management emerged. And this also goes to the question of just the idea behind not just the, the, the self-management of a firm, a factory, but the possibility which Henri Lefebvre was very interested in, in part by looking at the Yugoslav experience, of some kind of territorial self-management going up from the city scale and beyond. So I'll come back to the right to the city in a moment, but I think I view the right to the city as, as a, for, which is obviously a Lefebvrean concept, as part of that sort of autogestionary discourse. All right, are you guys with me so far? Am I, it's after lunch, so I'm hoping everyone's now fully, is everyone fully warmed up here? Yes, good. So now we're right in the thick of it here. So all of these urbanization processes are embedded within what I think of as a fundamental contradiction. So the city is the site and the medium and the outcome of a fundamental struggle, a fundamental contradiction which generates change and generates political strategy and generates political struggle. And again, this won't be, I don't think this will be anything new to you guys, but it, it's worth just getting clear, like what is that, what are these struggles all about? So on the one hand, the city is an accumulation strategy. I'll explain in a moment. And on the other hand, it's a counterforce. It's a site and a launching pad for autogestionary, radically democratic projects. So, so let's, just, let's just take a moment here and talk about those two dimensions because they take, again, different forms in different times and spaces. But that contradiction, the city is always changing, the urban is always changing, but that contradiction keeps expressing itself again and again and again. And we're in the midst of struggles around this contradiction. So the city on, and the rule of capital on the one side. So capital, from my point of view, influenced by David Harvey above all, is basically a circulation process. It's a process of circulation in which money is invested in pursuit of profits. Uh, so it's combined with labor power, machinery, infrastructure, etc. And the goal is to generate a profit which is continually reinvested in pursuit of more profit. That's what capital accumulation is. So everyone knows that. The key argument that David Harvey and others working in that tradition have made is that that circulation process is not simply a process of pure flow. Because in order to circulate, capital has to embed itself within the landscape, within the territory, within the city. It has to fix itself within relatively immobilized infrastructures, factories, roads, canals, airports, um, electricity and utility systems. So there are many different spatial infrastructures that have been produced during the history of capitalist industrialization up to the present, which provide a temporary moment of fixity within which the circulation of capital in pursuit of profits has occurred. But the whole history of capitalist urbanization, in some ways, can be understood around this interplay, this dialectic between fixity and motion. The circulation of capital presupposes a moment of fixity. So from the kind of first wave of industrialization embodied in 19th century Manchester that Engels wrote about, all the way up to contemporary large cities and mega cities, global cities all around the world, to landscapes of suburbanization from the United States and North America to Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and beyond, all the way up to um, the very large scale forms of urbanization that are occurring today in China and increasingly on a world scale. These infrastructures, this moment of fixity is kind of a key dimension of how the rule of capital is organized. So the spaces all around us, both again from the scale of the neighborhood, right outside this window, all the way up to the scale of the planet. So Tomislav mentioned some of the work that we're doing in the Urban Theory Lab on planetary urbanization, which is precisely trying to make sense of some of these world scale infrastructures of resource extraction, circulation, agro-industrial production, and so forth, which for us are part of the kind of urban fabric of the world. So clearly, the point, the point I'm making here is clearly capital needs the city. It needs the urban. Without the urbanization process, this moment of fixing infrastructure in historically specific ways, the pursuit of profits is impossible. So capital is spatialized on the landscape of the world at different scales. So the city as an accumulation strategy is kind of an expression of that 
profit and closure, privatized development, entrepreneurialism, many other different dimensions of cityness are basically the product, and you know these fall under the rubric, obviously, of neoliberal urbanism, not only neoliberal urbanism. Um, th these are part of um, the ways in which the rule of capital is expressed in the built environment. So, okay, but let's flip it around. Because, and this is why it's a, it's a genuine contradiction. It's a genuine dialectical contradiction. That's really only half the story. Because in the same way that the city is produced and instrumentalized to establish the rule of capital, um, it's constantly uh, appropriated and reappropriated against the rule of capital for all kinds of other purposes. And there are many different ways to understand this. The whole literature on social reproduction, Castells' work on collective consumption, provides one way in. The way in that I find most inspiring and powerful is Henri Lefebvre, Le Droit à la Ville, the right to the city, which in some ways it's a political program of Lefebvre's, and we can talk more about that, but it's also a way of understanding the evolution of urban struggles during the last 150 years. So the core idea behind Lefebvre's proposition of the right to the city, at least as I read it, is democratize. It's a, it's a, it's a claim that we must democratize the urban and reappropriate it from the rule of capital. But the radical thing, it's a double-sided theory as the way I read it. Um, it has at least two, um, two dimensions to it. So one dimension of the claim or the demand to democratize urban space is first of all to say the cities that currently exist, the built environments that currently exist, we must democratize access. So the struggle over public space, which we're gonna hear about later today is in significant measure a set of struggles that say, look, public space should be accessible to all. It shouldn't be privatized. It shouldn't be exclusionary. And furthermore, we should produce cities in which the city itself is the collective commons for all people, for all inhabitants, not simply the exclusive domain of the rich or any other, uh, any other particular category of group. So that's already a pretty radical, in this political conjuncture that we live in, that's already, you can do a lot of work with that. You can do a lot of political work with that. But the Lefebvre claim around the right to the city, it seems to me, goes way further than this. It's much more radical because what Lefebvre says when he talks about the right to the city, it's not only democratize access to what is. It's let's democratize the capacities, the collectively produced capacities uh, to produce and transform the built environment. So what that means is that you've got to produce cities that are not only accessible to all, but cities in which the regulatory infrastructures that govern the city are constantly accessible to autogestionary self-management from below to produce con completely different kinds of cities. And that's a very radical proposition because during most of the history of capitalism, I mean, again, this is a battleground. This is a bloody battleground, really. But during most of the history of capitalism, the, um, there's a constant struggle to effectively monopolize or privatize and enclose the capacity produce this, to produce the city. Sometimes by developers, often by developers. Uh, oftentimes in coalition with state institutions that have a particular vision of how to create a city that's viable for the rule of capital for various kinds of reasons. And also, um, unfortunately, the, the design professions and the engineering professions have played a key role in demarcating the capacity to produce place in ways that are t highly technical. So all the contemporary technical discourse these days about the smart city is just the latest version of a kind of very long tradition in which um, a technical approach to the urban is put forward as the way to create a more efficient or more rational or whatever kind of city and the knowledge uh, the, the kind of uh, capacity, the intellectual capacity to produce that smart city is um, claimed or monopolized by the technicians themselves. So we have many episodes in the history of architecture and urban planning in which that more technical project of urban management um, emerges and gains a lot of support and currency and essentially involves a radically undemocratic or even anti-democratic approach to the production of place. So again, for Lefebvre, um, that's completely problematic. So he spent a lot of time in some of some very polemical books, you know, in that French moment in the 1970s. You, there's no hesitation about sometimes being very rude 
to the people you're criticizing. I come out of a tradition where you know you criticize someone, you've got to try to do it politely and throw some more difficult stuff into the footnotes. If you read some of Lefebvre's writings from the 1970s, he's got his boxing gloves off and he's fully, you know, fully, you know, infuriated, and I think rightly so, by the kind of project of creating a sort of technocratic urbanism, and we see different versions of that emerging today, also in close alliance with neoliberalism. So privatization and technocracy, they, um, they, they, during the Fordist period, there was a particular technocratic project, um, which was also exclusionary, as was mentioned this morning. Um, and during the neoliberal moment, there's a new, new technocratic moment around big data. But anyway, for Lefebvre, the point is that the right to the city is around both of these dimensions. Democratizing access to place and democratizing the power to produce places. And, you know, it just seems to me you can use this lens not just as a political uh, imperative for today, but it also helps us understand a lot of struggles from the history of capitalist urbanization. And just to kind of get your minds going, these are all very local and kind of urban scaled struggles, but we could scale it up. But the Paris Commune, the, May, you know, the famous struggles of May 1968, we could obviously put in a lot of other examples from Eastern European cities in which people are struggling over the right to the city, the right to democratic control. Um, uh, the, a lot of kind of labor strikes. So this goes exactly to the theme of this morning's, the second panel this morning, the interplay between struggles to establish autogestion in the factory connecting back up to the autogestionary struggle at a territorial scale. So, so there's a very interesting and, again, historically specific link between struggles for workers' control of, the, of, of the, the shop floor and the way those in turn might, under some conditions, be translated up towards broader projects. This is from the coal miner strike in, under Thatcher, which some of you obviously recognize. Uh, you know, more general struggles. This is the, you know, the Battle of Seattle, 1999. So it's in part about Seattle, but oftentimes connecting back up, in this case very explicitly, to a broader claim about the undemocratic rule regime that the WTO was imposing on the entire world economy um, through neoliberalism. So that's a very powerful example of an urban struggle it, it explicitly thematizing a broader problem with the worldwide capitalist order. And more recent struggles, I mean, obviously we can give many other examples. The Occupy movement, uh, you know, is a certain, in a certain way, um, an analogous set of arguments in the contemporary context, the indi indignados, I'm saying it wrong, but the Spanish kind of struggles, and you know, the more recent struggles in Gezi Park, Istanbul, and there are different global struggles kind of ricocheting around the world, which in many ways are based within cities, particular sites within cities that are being privatized. I mean, the Gezi Park example is obviously a, it's a, it's a nationally government, national government imposed privatization of urban space, provoking struggles that not only thematize a different model of the city, but more generally a different model of territorial, um, of the territorial or order of Turkey and maybe Europe and beyond. So the, the urban, the, these examples for me simply embody the proposition that the urban is a force field. So you might begin with a very local struggle, but in so doing, you thematize in this tradition broader problems of unequal, undemocratic access and also unequal, undemocratic control over the means to produce the world that we live in. To, again, that's a strong statement, but to me, that's the heart of what this whole thing is about. So the city is a counterforce, different ideas, the right to the city, the city is commons, the city is collective oeuvre, that's a Lefebvrean idea, and many other ideas that accompany that. So, and all of this is, again, as I tried to suggest at the beginning, beginning mediated through state institutions at very spatial scale. So it's not just the rule of capital, the right to the city, that very struggle, again, I come back to the point I made at the end of my opening propositions, that very struggle between the rule of capital and the right to the city is fundamentally mediated by state institutions and therefore, I would argue, the state itself is the terrain or a terrain on which that struggle occurs. It could be the local state, it could be the national state, it could be the EU, it could be the WTO. But state institutions, insofar as their rules create the conditions under which the built environment is produced, appropriated, and transformed, the state itself has to be the constant terrain of struggle over the future of the urban. To the degree that we democratize the state, again, I'm just channeling Lefebvre right here, but I think these are powerful ideas. To the degree that we democratize state institutions at any spatial scale, that opens up the possibility of democratizing access to place and the capacity to produce place. 
All right. Oh, man. All right, so that's 40 minutes. I could, maybe I should just stop here and then we collect. I'm serious. That's like a, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff, you know, hopefully a pretty, you know, user-friendly overview of what I think the intellectual uh, foundations are of this tradition. And I have a, obviously a lot to say about neoliberalization, but maybe, maybe like basically the argument, if you gave me another 20 minutes, which don't, don't do that, don't give me that, um, I would try to specify some of the ways in which neoliberalization is kind of a contemporary moment of this. Okay, 15 minutes. 15. <laughs> mm. 10. 10. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you guys want? Let's do a little autogestionary negotiation here. <laughs> I'm really happy just, like, let, I'll sit down and then we just discuss it. And maybe I go through some of my slides. But if you want me to just give you a little more, you know, I could... Can you give us some examples when, where social movements are influencing the, the urbanization? Like, social movements that are... Yeah, I, I can, but I don't know if this is yet the right moment to do that. So and I'm totally, we need to do that, but I don't know if this, if we're still on a pretty... The plane is still kind of hovering, you know, like... I don't know. What do you think, Tony? Okay, okay. So what, what let's we take 15 minutes 15? to lend oh, it. God. 20. Okay, go. No, no, I want less. I want less. Oh, okay. 10. Then you have 10. <laughs> What's the vibe in here? You guys, it sounds like people are game for like, I keep it going. I would stop this podcast. No, no, no. That's going to, that's going to tangle me up in a knot. With, I, no, I have a plan. It's just a question of, all right, I'm, let me just keep going then. Okay, resume. Yes. Yeah. Okay, no, no, because we, we've got one direction, one, that's the danger of autogestion, is that <laughs> you're completely frozen. Put it to vote. Pardon? Put it to vote. No, I feel like we could, but, but I... you're talking about democratization, put it on vote. Yeah. <laughs> what should I do? Okay, I've so... Opened up a no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> let me seize the, the autocrat position and say you continue. So the blame is on me. Here's what I propose. No, no, here's, a, here's what I suggest. It, let, me, um, let me just fill in a little bit more like how this connects with neoliberalization, and then I'll stop because I, I want to have time for discussion, but I'm not going to go through the full thing because it'll, it'll take too long. But I felt like it was important to go through those foundations just in terms of like, I don't know how familiar people are with that, but even if you are like trying to come up with that synthesis, like when I think about like what is the method, you know, that we're using here, um, in, a, in a big tradition. I think it's useful to just get clear about that. That's part of what my project is and if it, it, I'll be curious to know like is that a productive um, framework for thinking about some of the urban struggles that different folks in the room are engaged with. So, so note that I'm saying neoliberalization not neoliberalism. So um, just as a starting point, the, the, the core of it from my point of view is that it's a it's a multi-scale project. It's not just national, it's not just local, it's not just global. It takes all kinds of different forms at different scales. And it's basically a project that emerges as a collision with inherited institutional landscapes that are experiencing crisis. So it takes one particular form in North America and Western Europe where Keynesian Fordist modes were predominant. It takes a different form in Eastern Europe and post-state socialist countries in which the institutional legacies are defined by you know, different pathways of industrialization, although not entirely different from those of Fordism. One could argue that there's a Ford, that, that state socialism is a form of Fordism. There are different forms of Fordism within state socialism. We can have that conversation. Um, and it takes yet another form in China and yet another form in um, the East Asian developmental states where arguably patterns of neoliberalization are emerging, and in Latin America, which had yet another pathway of um, economic and industrial restructuring during the 1970s and 1980s, and also with very different political forms, um, some of which are dictatorships, some of which are, are, demo are democracies. So, so it's not just a set of, you know, you can say here's the ideology of neoliberalism. It's free markets, it's privatization, and you can trace it back to von Hayek and Friedman, and the Mont Pelerin Society, and that, you know, we have lots of really good literature that does that, and that's a very useful thing to do. But the key methodological point, starting point for the work that I've been doing for a while with Nick Theodore and Jamie Peck is that, well, it's really a process, and it's a process that has to be embedded within particular conjunctures of crisis formation in different zones of the world economy. But at the same time, we want to insist that we need a general concept of neoliberalization. So note that I'm still, I'm insisting 
that we need a general concept. So in other words, it's not just here's the Eastern European pattern of market-oriented restructuring, or here's the Croatian pattern, or here's the Zagrebian pattern. But there's a powerful move, potentially powerful move, that's made by identifying these locally or regionally or nationally specific forms of regulatory restructuring with a broader system of worldwide regulatory restructuring. And there's a lot of debate about this question within the literature on neoliberalism. Some of my colleagues push towards a, a much more locally specific analysis, insisting on the exceptional character of certain formations of neoliberalism, for example, in East Asia. But for me, that's, that's problematic on a lot of levels, starting with the question of like, well, then why call it neoliberalism at all, if it's radically particular? Um, so saying that it's a locally specific neoliberalism could be a useful thing, because obviously we need to make sense of local particularity. But if you're going to use the word neoliberalism or neoliberalization, you're methodologically required. You're logically required to be able to specify what the connection is between that local dynamic of market-oriented restructuring is, what the connection is between the local, locally specific dynamic of market-oriented restructuring and broader dynamics elsewhere. So ne neoliberalization in that sense is a structural category. It's a structural category. And the heart of it, there are a number of different uh, uh, kind of interpretive frameworks out there, but I find the David Harvey argument about accumulation by dispossession pretty useful um, and pretty powerful. So in other words, accumulation by dispossession has been ongoing throughout the history of capitalism. It's basically the use of state power, often violently, to um, expropriate people from any kinds of conditions of social reproduction um, that are not commodified. Or to put it the other way around, it's forcibly imposing commodity relations upon people, not only in their labor relations, but in their social reproduction. And in this tradition, from David Harvey and others, neoliberalization is the latest form of accumulation by dispossession. So again, it collides in historically specific ways in different regions of the world economy with institutions that previously protected people to some degree from commodification. Whatever the kind of problems and economic dynamics and political relations were within those regimes, neoliberalization collides with that inherited regime and tries to unleash a new wave of commodification. So the nature of Fordist Keynesianism in the United States is different from the nature of Fordist Keynesianism in Germany. And the nature of both of those systems is radically different, obviously, than the institutional, institutional landscapes um, that tendentially protected people from commodification in ex-Yugoslavia. And that system, as we heard this morning, was in turn a different form of state socialism than the forms that obtained elsewhere within Eastern Europe. So there's a need for specificity here, but it's that moment of collision between a project of market-oriented re restructuring and an inherited institutional landscape that in some way or another protects people from the ravages of commodification. That's the heart of the matter. So for us, it's a process. It's a process that's keep, that keeps evolving. So the nature of neoliberalization, let's say, in the 1980s, when Thatcher and Reagan were um, imposing some pretty radical reforms upon their respective countries, is completely different than the nature of neoliberalization that we see in the 90s or into the 2000s. So it's an ongoing, path-dependent process. The institutional landscape that neoliberalization projects are colliding with is different in the 2000s or today in the wake of the global financial crisis than it was in the 1970s when they were colliding with an institutional landscape that was undergoing a different kind of um, economic crisis. Um, there are different neoliberalization strategies. It's not a single pure form. It's contextually specific, a point that I've already been making. And again, this may be quite obvious to folks in this room, but in terms of the broader ideological discourse, this is a fundamental point. So neoliberalization, it's, it's fully ideological and fully illusory to think of neoliberalization using neoliberal ideology itself, namely as a rolling back of the state and a rolling forward of the market. That's the narrative through which privatization justifies itself. In other words, let's get the state out of the way and let's um, privatize and let the market do its thing. Fully ideological. Fully. <laughs> because, in fact, what's happening is that the state is imposing privatization. And the state is creating, again, in different ways in different places, market-friendly regulatory arrangements that give capital discretionary power over social resources that were previously controlled through other mechanisms. And again, that may be totally obvious in this room, but I think it's fundamental also for the political struggle and the ideological struggle. So to dismantle this utterly fanciful myth 
that neoliberalism is unleashing the market and getting the state out of the way. There's a book written a long time ago by an economic, uh, a, actually a political scientist named Stephen Fogel, who was studying the privatization of different utilities uh, sectors in the United States, Japan, and I can't remember what the other one was, but it was Stephen Fogel. It was called Freer Markets, More Rules. And that pretty much goes right to the heart of it. You can open up markets, and, but it, you know, through privatization, liberalization, deregulation, but you know, in doing that, you've got to create a huge juridical legal infrastructure in order to regulate what's going on. So let's just put aside the sort of the utterly. I mean, it's. It, I mean, it would be funny if it weren't so. De it, if it didn't have such devastating consequences, that such a childish and absurd assumption could have so much. Uh, could be. Could could be. Could have so much weight in our everyday lives in terms of how we understand what's going on in the world. We need on the left to continue to dismantle that um, ideology of the rolling back of the state. Neoliberalism is a state project. Again, now I bring in Bob Jessup. Neoliberalism is a state project. It's a project of creating state institutions and regulatory infrastructures that facilitate commodification marketization. And privatization is a mechanism. Maybe here's another point that isn't on my slide, but which is quite important. We're interested in privatization. Privatization is not only a way of reorganizing the economy, it's a way of reorganizing the state itself. So, so look at the ways in which privatization, in any context, creates new institutional arrangements that, that undermine relays of democratic accountability that might have previously existed in relation to the, the sectors that, or the institutions that are being privatized, and creates new infrastructures of regulatory um, organization. So there's a lot of literature on this. I worked in that literature a bit myself a while ago. And it's, it's really important to see neoliberalization not just as an accumulation strategy. It's a project of reorganizing institutions, state institutions included. Uh, I'm just going to, I've kind of already made this point, so I'll just quickly summarize it. This point that I've been making about neoliberalization as a colli it collides with inherited institutional landscapes. So there's a destructive and creative moment this is an argument that Nick Theodore and I have been making for a while. So neoliberalization projects attempt to dismantle some inherited infrastructure protecting people from commodification, but there's also a creative moment. So trying to establish a new regulatory geography that's market friendly. That's essentially the point I already made. Uh, all right, I'm going to skip all this. A couple of consequences of this, which might be a useful way to frame some of the discussion that we're having here. Um, there's no such thing as a single form of the neoliberal city, a single form of the neoliberal economy, a single form of the neoliberal state. There are different forms in which these processes occur. And again, they're derived from this collision between neoliberalization projects and inherited institutional landscapes. Second consequence, and this is again fully at odds with neoliberal ideology. Neoliberal ideology tells us, again to use the example of privatization, that if you privatize the outcome will basically be more or less the same in any place. It'll open up markets. It'll generate economic growth. Fully ideological. Um, if you study privatization of a single sector across different, uh, different places, you'll see all kinds of different political and social and ecological consequences. Very much, as we've called it, variegated, differentiated. So um, contextually specific outcomes which hinge upon political struggle. So again, it, th this is another point in which the mediation of these processes by social movements matters quite a lot. And then a final consequence of this, and maybe I'll make this my conclusion, even though I, I have a few other things to say, but I think it's time to open this up for a discussion. So I'm now moving into my landing pattern. Um, so one thing that's, that's really important to me, um, both as an intellectual proposition and as a political strategic argument, is that um, on the one hand, the local really matters. The urban and the city really matter. Hopefully that's from everything I've been saying for the last 45 minutes plus, hopefully that's clear. But at the same time, in less local struggles to reappropriate space from privatization are connected back up to super local struggles to reorganize the rule of the, rules of the game, then they're going to be seriously vulnerable to um, failure. So that's a, that's a strong claim, but that's something that maybe we can debate about. What I mean by that is that, um, you know, take the European Union as an example. 
for any local struggle against neoliberalism in the European Union, unless it's connected to a broader struggle to create a more um, solidaristic, redistributive, uh, cosmopolitan European Union, um, that local struggle is going to be um, seriously limited. So the EU imposes all kinds of economic rules upon cities, regions, and territories throughout the EU space, and indeed beyond. So it's basically an argument for a multi-scalar political strategy. The city is a force field. The city matters. But so too do the broader rule regimes within which cities are embedded. And so I'm very interested in, in the, the ways in which left thinkers, Samir Amin would be a good example. I don't know how many people around here read Samir Amin. Engage with envisioning a future of capitalism at the, uh, at the world, uh, sorry, uh, envision ways of transforming capitalism from within, not just at a local or regional or national scale, but at a, at a world scale. So creating new rules of investment, new rules of the financial uh, regime, new rules of labor migration, um, new rules of ecological impacts. So the question of envisioning autogestion and some kind of alternative, the city is a basing point, the urban is a basing point through which we can go quite a ways, but we need to connect that up also through alliances with urban struggles in other locations to, other, to broader super local visions of how the world economy might be organized. Okay, you guys, thank you for your patience. I'm going to stop right here and hopefully we have a little time for discussion.